Now, as we just heard foreshadowed, it's my great pleasure to welcome Philippe Cousteau and Olivia Blondheim as our keynote speakers this morning. Philippe Cousteau is a multi-Emmy-nominated TV host, author, speaker, social entrepreneur, and ocean advocate. He's produced numerous shows to increase awareness, appreciation, and action for the natural world. His conservation efforts are focused on solving global social environmental problems. In 2004, he founded Earth Echo International, the leading environmental education organization dedicated to inspiring youth to take action for a sustainable planet. Philippe will be joined by Olivia Blondheim, a member of Earth Echo International Youth's Leadership Council. Olivia is a recent graduate from Drew University and will begin PhD work in integrative biology at the University of South Florida this fall. Olivia likes jellyfish. <laughs> we want to talk to her more about that. Just so you know, we will have a short time for a few questions following the presentation. So if you do have questions, please come to one of the microphones in the aisles following the presentation. Please join me in welcoming our speakers. All right. Good morning, everyone. <laughs> Ooh, that was grim. Okay, one more time. Uh, do we have coffee? Do we need some coffee or something in here? Uh, I mean, yes, I heard a yes back there. Uh, so we'll try one more time. Because let's see, I know it's 9 o'clock. I'm on West Coast. Who's on West Coast time? Yes, yeah, so quite a few. So we have it much rougher than the rest of you. So good morning. That's better. That's better. That's good. Um, thank you, everybody, for, for joining us. We're really delighted to be here, Olivia and myself. Dr. Link, thank you for the introduction, and, and uh, we're, we're delighted. I uh, love that story from Dr. Gallaudet earlier uh, and his terrific introduction as well. And I do want to also call out Roger, my man right there. <laughs> we couldn't do it without you. Thank you so much for all your work in putting this together and, and having us uh, the privilege to be here this morning with you all, which is... Uh, which is a delight, and I've been looking forward to it. Um, and in particular, I know that uh, they've already been called out, but I'm going to call them out again. The students that are here today, I'm very excited that you're here. I saw you pile in. This is what we're all about. This is why Olivia's on stage with us. So we're going to give you another round of applause. How's that? Thank you. Uh, and actually, let's see here. I think I need to pull up my slideshow, which should be oh, somewhere, right? Because we've got a couple of photos and some videos and some fun stuff for you today. So, uh, and as uh, Dr. Link said, um, can we, yeah, perfect. We know that gentleman. Uh, as Dr. Link said, we're going to um, have about 35, 40 minutes or so, and then we're going to be able to talk to you and uh, engage in some conversation for a little bit. So I'm going to set my watch here, and we'll get going. All right, so uh, now I want to start with this photograph here because uh, I think it's very uh, uh, interesting. You know, it's this year, 75 years ago, actually in January, 75 years ago, that my grandfather first stepped into the Marne River outside of Paris with the prototype aqualung or scuba device. Uh, and it was the first time that anything like that was ever tested. So it's really only been 75 years, hard to believe, since he's been doing, he did the work, started the work that he, uh, that he started. And uh, when you think about in that time, you know, we put 12 people on the moon, but only three people uh, at the bottom of the ocean. So we, uh, we still, in many ways, as we all know, are scratching the surface of this incredible world that we live in. Um, and I wanted to also start with this picture because when I think of my grandfather, you know, a lot of people think of him um, as this, as a, as a lanky Frenchman with a red cap on and a funny accent. And uh, when I think about him, I think not of an explorer, not of a uh, pioneer, a writer, an author, a filmmaker. I think about someone who at their core, above all, was a problem solver. Now, you know, he didn't start out because, with a passion for conservation. When they started diving 75 years ago, it was simply a, a, a desire to solve a problem. He was a free diver, 
and wanted to spend more time underwater. Simple as that. He met an engineer, Emile Gagnon, and together after years they tinkered and developed that technology that allowed people to swim like a fish freely for the first time. Because, you know, before that, especially, you guys won't, probably won't know this, but before that, uh, you know, it was clomping around with a big copper helmet on and a hose to the surface and lead boots. I mean, that was really how people uh, could spend any uh, extended period of time underwater. So this was a first, but it was his desire for exploration and his drive to, to, to spend more time underwater that caused him to invent that. And it wasn't until, you know, the, the, the next few decades, the 50s and 60s, that he saw such a decline in the health of the environment that he said, you know, it's no longer about exploration, it's about conservation. So it was an evolution for him. Um, and, uh, you know, he recognized that, that storytelling fundamentally is the language of human learning. And um, as you heard earlier, Dr. Gallaud said he launched multiple television programs, uh, books, etc., that helped bring the world's awareness to the wonders beneath the ocean. And he was joined by, uh, by my father, uh, Philippe Cousteau Sr., uh, through much of that work until, unfortunately, in 1979, my father was killed in an airplane accident um, uh, flying the seaplane, actually, that they launched so many of their expeditions from. And, um, and that work also inspired me. That is me. Uh, I can never remember how old. Mom, how old? My mother here is in the audience. She likes to call herself the creator. Uh, Maman, how old am I in this picture again? Nine, ten, something like that? Eight, six, five. There you go, five. <laughs> uh, I'm not good with age. I don't have kids yet, so the whole age thing I'm not very uh, versed in. And though she will deny it, I do think she just put, used to put a bowl, of, a bowl on my head and cut around it. Um, she denies it, but I think that's exactly what happened. So my grandfather you know, had a huge influence on me in his life and his work uh, as a problem solver. And um, you know, what I learned from that legacy is that drive to solve problems. And it's a drive that we all share in this room, um, which again is why I'm here today and delighted to be here today. Um, but one of the things that they had to do in order to solve problems, they had to think about things a little bit differently. So in that spirit, we wanted to try something a little different with you today. Um, now, 15 years ago, I founded an organization called Earth Echo International. And uh, we founded that in honor of my father and my grandfather and that legacy. Now, over that time, uh, we've become one of the leading youth environmental education groups in, uh, in the country. And one of our most exciting programs is called the Youth Leadership Council. Um, and as you heard from Dr. Link, uh, Olivia is a member of that organization uh, of Earth Echo, that part of Earth Echo. And it's part of our commitment to empower the next generation. Because we're true believers um, that they're the leaders that can drive change, not only tomorrow, but today. And the Youth Leadership Council is all about providing platforms so that their critical perspective and voice can be heard. And that's why we invited Olivia. And we're so delighted that the conference organizers allowed, uh, allowed us to do a little bit of a different thing, have co-keynote speakers up here today. Um, as you heard, she's a marine biologist, uh, a leader in, in her community, who's done incredible work uh, just leading up now to... Uh, to just graduated from college. And um, she's worked with NOAA and the NSF and traveled the Caribbean and the Northwest um, and actually just did a TED Talk. Is it live? I think it's live, right? It'll be live just, this week, so definitely check that week. out. Yes, you do have to check that out. Um, so, uh, so be on the look for that. But uh, we are really delighted, and I'm delighted, that Olivia could join me up here on stage today. Yeah, but it's such a privilege to be here, and it really does take such a village to raise us. So I'm so grateful uh, for Philippe and Earth the whole team at Earth Echo for inviting me to speak today. Um, and of course, Roger and the team at NOAA working behind the scenes to put us up here today. Um, and of course, like I have so many people who have served as role models and mentors. One of my mentors, Rick Ritter, here in the audience. So it's so great to see him. Um, so thank you guys. It's such an honor to share with you some of the things that I've learned on the Youth Leadership Council at Earth Echo about communicating research and conservation efforts with you today. So... Um, what we uh, wanted to do is, you know, recognize that the theme of this conference, of course, is to increase one of many themes, but a, a critical theme is to increase the understanding of climate impacts on oceans, marine resources, and the many people, businesses, and economies that depend on that. Um, and as uh, Dr. Link said earlier, you know, change is here. And understanding that change and how it impacts our world is what we're all here to do and what you all dedicate your lives to do every day. And um, because there's no you know, question about that, from climate change, ocean acidification, and all the other impacts that, uh, that Dr. Gallaudet mentioned. Um, I've had the opportunity to see a lot of that, as have you, with my own eyes. Yep, it's absolutely devastating to see how 
our reefs are changing, and many of them are being destroyed. When I was in Bonaire, I loved all the animal reefs, and it was just always so amazing to see how diverse these ecosystems are. But I was looking at photos from only 10, 15 years ago, it was shocking to see that the reefs today were only paling in comparison to what they used to be. So I know there's so much work that we have to do to really see our oceans are changing, and how are we going to respond to that? So one way that I, one area of my research is looking at jellies. As many of us know, jellies are, blooms are increasing at an alarming rate in response to our changing oceans. So last summer I had the privilege of being off of the Oregon coast the Northwest Fishery Science Center, and we started seeing thousands of these creatures known as pyrosomes washing up on beaches from Alaska to Northern California. So you can see here they're can be a few centimeters long to over a meter long, and they're a type of tunicate, so they're closer to sea squirts or south. And what's most fascinating about them is they're actually a tropical species. So now when I'm talking about how many we were seeing, this kind of gives you an idea. This was taken about 15 miles off the Oregon coast. You won't see, see too many in the beginning, but once you pass about 10 meters in depth, you start to see them by the hundreds. In only about five hours, we captured almost 1,200 pyrosomes on our footage. And now you can imagine, this is happening all along the coast. So while we can't necessarily say this is climate change, we do know that in 2015 and 2016, the North Pacific experienced one of the strongest El Ninos on record. Now, when you think about that, that warmer water may be leading to a range expansion in pyrosome. So as you can see, there's quite a few out there, and there may be quite a few changes to our marine ecosystems because of their presence. Now, when we look at this, whether I'm studying pyrosomes off the Oregon coast, or Philippe is filming on the Great Barrier Reef, or you're doing the research in your lab. What really it comes down to is one question. How are we going to solve problems? Now, one thing that I think that we all have in common in this room is that not unlike Philippe's father and grandfather, we are each explorers. And what is exploration if not the drive to solve problems? the desire to peek over the next hill and see what lies beyond. And ultimately, to change how we see our ecosystems. Now I know as scientists and conservationists, we dedicate our entire lives to the research that we do. I know so many of us spend countless hours in the field and the lab, oftentimes doing the not so glamorous work that never seems to get highlighted on TV. <laughs> I'm sure on Blue Planet, we don't only see the person who is getting seasick off the back of the boat in rough scenes or the person who spent countless hours just going to collect one sample all the way up to their waist in mud and water. Or of course, those really late nights when we just want our R code to finally run. These are all the challenges that we brave every single day, and we make daily sacrifices with our family or friends to achieve these goals. But what it all comes down to is ultimately, we have one thing that we desire, and that is we love what we do do, and we know that the work that we do is incredibly important. Now, I know as conservationists and scientists, we sometimes, I know for me anyway, I oftentimes forget um, that other people can't love this all the time the same ecosystems or organisms that I love. Sometimes I forget that I spend so, much, so many hours studying one particular creature that other people don't even know about them. Thank you. I'm sorry. <laughs> So anyway, <laughs> so yeah, so we need to be, I sometimes forget about that. I know Philippe and I often joke that we've developed the technology to travel hundreds of meters beneath the ocean surface. But sometimes we forget to use the technology in our back pockets or in our living rooms. I know at the Youth Leadership Council, we use social media platforms like Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram to reach people who might not necessarily be looking at our research or conservation. So for example, when somebody's just scrolling through their feed, they may learn about pyrosomes when they may have never even heard of them before. Yeah, it's, it, it is, it's true. Olivia and I actually, um, we've talked about this. We talk about a lot of the Youth Leadership Council at Earth Echo, you know, is how do we make our work relevant? How do we help people um, connect the dots, particularly for people who, as Olivia said, uh, may never set foot in the ocean, certainly haven't ever set foot in the ocean, um, and really don't let's face it, care about the kinds of things, about pyrosomes, about the kind of things that we do care about. So how do we connect the dots and expand the audience? Um, it's, it's, a, it's a daily question and challenge that we ask ourselves all the time. Absolutely, and the consequences that we're seeing of this right now are that some of the most influential leaders in our nation 
do not believe nor trust in our research on climate change. So ultimately, it comes down to us to be able to say, how are we going to communicate this and basically get back people's trust in what we do? So, you know, it, it's, as we said, it's a constant challenge. It's one that we're faced with all the time, that we are all faced with all the time. And that's what today is all about and, and our time with you is all about. Um, and why the work at YLC, Youth Leadership Council at Earth Echo, I believe is so important because, you know, we're really about empowering, not just paying lip service to, but truly empowering young people because they are a critical, they have critical perspective and skill sets now to help us be better communicators and to reach a broader audience. Um, you know, I, I have to tell you that, uh, that through our work with YLC, we've learned as much from them as, uh, as I think that they have from us. Uh, I'm going to give sneak peek. I mean, for example, uh, Olivia is going to share a story in a little bit about uh, relevance of audiences. And we were talking as we were preparing for this. And, you know, I can post on Facebook. I've got the photos and the video. I can got that down. Um, but then she started going on talking about how she was running, like, surveys through Facebook with the local communities and all these great things. I was like, wow, I didn't even know you could do that. So um, it's a great example of the perspective. We need all of our guns blazing, um, so to speak, to, uh, to engage people in this world today around these issues. And um, so we wanted to share a few strategies. We were asked today to, to share a couple more videos and a few strategies um, that we use to help us be successful in our communications efforts. Um, but first, I want to do a simple survey. Now, this is audience interaction, so do not be afraid to raise your hands, please. Um, so my first question is, how, when you uh, hear the words climate change, how many of you think of this? Nobody thinks of Paul. Amazing. I thought so. Thank you. All right. Uh, so most of you in the room think of polar bears when you think of climate change. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a very standard kind of response. Um, so when you see this, how many of you think climate change? Far fewer of you. Also a very standard uh, response. Um, now, we all recognize that we individuals in this room, particularly in this room, are making tremendous change and have a tremendous impact on the world around us. But ultimately, we also recognize that it's going to take everyone working together to actually do this. Um, the challenge is, how do we grow the audience of people who care about these issues? And I would argue that if we're going to do this, we have to show people how by protecting and conserving the ocean, we are ultimately saving ourselves. That solving problems around climate change, supporting science, can provide opportunity and purpose in their lives and can help them do the fundamental things that everybody cares about, like taking care of their families and their communities. And that's one of the disconnects. Because while we in this audience care about polar bears, no question, understand the connectivity of species, ecosystems, and the whole big, rich fabric of this world, I can tell you that polar bears probably don't move the needle for enough people. It doesn't grow the audience of people that need to care about these issues. Not one single conversation or question about climate change in the presidential debates. Okay, This issue is not registering the way it should. And I think the challenge then for us is to help people connect those dots and start thinking more about this when they hear climate change and less about polar bears. And you know what happens? If we're successful in that effort, the polar bears win anyway. But maybe we need to get a little bit further away from polar bears and a little bit more to how these issues affect us as people and human beings in our daily lives and the issues that we care about. So the first rule that we've really, we're going to give you three rules today that we've learned to really communicate some of our ideas about conservation and research. So the first one we're going to give you is to know your audience. We have to make it relevant for people to care. So now when I'm going to go back to the pyrosome bloom that I was studying last year. Now, when these pyrosomes were washing up on, on the coast, they, of course, were like these alien species. They're really cool to look at. And a lot of beachgoers found them fascinating, as well as scientists, because this was a new discovery. But was, what was more concerning was for the fishing communities. Okay. 
we're going to go with it. Um, <laughs> so this catch right here was actually a catch from a pink shrimper. Um, so you can see some of that pink shrimp in between. But most of the, his deck is covered in these pyrosomes. Now this is another example here. This is a trolling line that they use off the coast. They catch albacore tuna, salmon, and other commercial fish species we like to consume. And you can see it's just covered again in pyrosomes. Now these fishers are going out every single day, and this is what they're bringing back. So it comes down to not just you know, our scientific interest here, but also their livelihoods and the livelihoods of fishing communities all along the coast. So one way that I thought that this was a really great way to interact with the fishers was by setting up, as Fleet mentioned, a Facebook survey. So a lot of uh, fishers on the West Coast have Facebook groups already. They post stories about time out at sea, job postings, and all kinds of information um, about their work. And so one way that I did was just set up a simple Facebook survey and ask some questions about where were they seeing the pyrosomes? How many were they seeing? Other interesting information that they found. And it also provided this opportunity for them to ask me questions as well. I spoke with multiple fishers who were fascinated by this bloom and had stories from their fathers and grandfathers of how time out at sea they'd never seen pyrosomes before. So it was creating this history of what the Oregon coast and the coast up towards Alaska really looked like in respect to this. So you can see this was just Facebook. This was just one tool that I used to be able to say, hey, these groups out there, they have some great, they're already posting on it anyway. Let's see if they want to provide any extra information. And now I have this doorway to be able to go out and say, hey, if this, as this bloom is continuing to persist in this you know, 2018 and they may be sticking around, we may be able to work together to continue mapping out where these pyrosomes are. So knowing the audience, I love that story, because knowing your audience and recognizing that there are multiple constituencies and that fundamentally we, we have to talk to everybody a little bit differently is a core tenet of good communications, right? You need to know who you're talking about. I think so often uh, I make the mistake of forgetting who I'm talking to and talking about what they care about as opposed to what I often and what we all tend to do, which is talk about what we care about. Um, and so understanding who your audience is and, um, and, and making your communications relevant to them is key. Um, and the second rule is, as much as possible, make it entertaining. Um, and try and capture the imagination of your audience. Yeah, I can guarantee you, when I started in marine biology, I went out to people and said, hey, I want to learn all about the vertical distribution of the pelagic colonial tunic at Pyrosoma Atlanticum in the Northern California Current. Said no one ever. <laughs> no one ever is going to use that kind of language. And instead, when I talk about pyrosomes, I talk about the Borg of the Sea or gelatinous sea pickles, because it gets people interested and it gives them references that they can relate to. So finding those entry points, Dr. Guy, you talked a little bit about uh, you know, the films and the documentaries that, that my grandfather and father did for so many years. Those were stories not about an octopus, not about um, uh, sea lions. They were stories about people going on an adventure. And when you watched those documentaries, you wanted to go with them. Uh, you wanted to join them. Because remember, people relate to people. It just so happened that the wonderful benefit of that was that you learned about octopus, you cared about the ocean, you wanted to go and explore these things, but fundamentally, people connect to people. Um, so we did a series, uh, um, I wanted to give you an example of that, what we do, uh, and how we look at different audiences and how we create content that's a little bit different uh, in lots of different uh, uh, platforms. We did a series with CNN's Great Big Story about, uh, uh, about a year ago that was sought to, to break new ground and explore ways that we could make these kinds of issues appeal to, as I said, to a, to a different audience. So we did a spoof of, a spoof actually, a spoof spoof, I guess maybe you'd call it. Um, anyone a fan of Wes Anderson here? Just a few of you, all right. I'm, I'm thinking there's more of you, but some of you are shy. So um, quite a few fans of Wes Anderson in the audience today. And have any of you seen the movie The Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou? All right, so more of you have seen that movie than are fans of Wes Anderson. That's interesting. Um, and uh, so it's also one of my favorites, spoof of a spoof, as I said. It's a, a spoof of my uh, grandfather and, and their adventures. Um, so we decided to, uh, to celebrate that. And if you like Wes Anderson and you like Life Aquatic, uh, I think you might um, like this. This show was targeted, it was an online series that we did with GBS, and um, it had tens of millions of views on, on all the episodes that we did, and uh, certainly targeted to a younger audience, a, a different audience, and the response was terrific. Um, and just an example of how we were able to have a little bit of fun. And one rule that we had on set is that all the cocktails were real. 
So, um, you know, we'd have 12 or 13 hour filming days that we were on set and uh, um, they got more and more interesting as the day went on because, you know, I had to memorize lines, I'm not an actor, and uh, so I'd flubbed them a lot. We had to do, I think, that one scene with an old fashioned, like, five times. Um, so those were, those, we, usually, we usually actually say those to the end of the day so that I could uh, not have too much more to do. Um, but we had a lot of fun with it, and it was looking, again, at how do we tell stories a little bit differently. And um, um, it, was, it, was a, it was a great success. So the third rule uh, that we engage, that we always try and remember, is to provide stories of hope and optimism, to really think about how we engage people in being part of the solution and not too much doom and gloom. There's a lot of doom and gloom, uh, rightfully so, that goes around out there, but fear, we know psychologically, is a short-term motivator. Um, again, that if we want to grow the audience and build a constituency of people that care about these issues, then we need to do it in a way that is optimistic and that brings people under the tent and grows the tent uh, and grows the constituency, essentially, of folks that vote for the ocean, that support science and trust and recognize um, that what you all do every single day is, uh, is critical and important and true. Um, so for Shark Week 2016, um, we did a special called Nuclear Sharks. And um, now that title, I don't know if any of you saw, saw it, but uh, it was the number one show for Shark Week that year. And uh, we were trying to employ a little bit of our rules into the title, Nuclear Sharks. A lot of people were very intrigued by that uh, name. Uh, one of the number one questions I got is like, wow, are these sharks glowing in the dark? What's happening? Um, but it, it, it got, captured people's imaginations. And actually what happened is we did this episode or did this special uh, we went out to the Bikini Atoll, went diving, uh, where we did so many, the United States conducted so much nuclear bombing back in the, uh, in the 50s and 60s. And um, in fact, we went diving into the crater of Castle Bravo, which is the largest bomb the United States ever detonated. And uh, it's still this sandy crater out there in the middle of uh, a Bikini Atoll. Everything in that area was completely uh, decimated, destroyed. I mean, this is the worst fire and brimstone you can think humanity could throw at an ecosystem. I mean, dozens of nuclear devices we detonated in this part of the world uh, for well over a decade. And so what we were trying to figure out is rumors that we'd heard of this exploding population of gray reef sharks. And yet, Bikini is a few hundred miles away from the next nearest atoll uh, or island. And so what we wanted to try and figure out is, these sharks that are typically non-migrating, what are they, how, do, how did they make their way back over hundreds of miles in open ocean back to Bikini? Are they really there? Is it truly in an abundance um, that we've heard stories about? And um, it was pretty amazing. So we tagged about 20 sharks with satellite tags. And um, we tracked where they went. And indeed, we found them moving around to uh, uh, other islands that were 100 plus miles away. And unfortunately, there's a bit of a sad ending to the story. Uh, about half of the sharks that we tagged with those, those satellite tags uh, that you saw my wife doing at the back of the boat um, were fished. And uh, the Marshall Islands is, is one of the largest, not the largest uh, shark sanctuary in the world. Um, there's still loads of illegal fishing out there and finning. And um, we know this because the tags would be zigzagging around all over the place, and then all of a sudden, they'd stop and they'd go, be going in a straight line back to Bebe in the Philippines, Guam. Uh, actually, one of the ships landed in Guam, and we know this because they, they must have just taken the satellite tags and left them on, on the deck. They didn't probably know what they were. So we're tracking this in real time, and um, we called the officials at NOAA um, and the Coast Guard at Guam and say, someone's catching sharks, and there's, there was one ship in port. Um, and uh, so we knew it was one ship, and uh, so the officials planned, and they planned a raid for the next day. Uh, unfortunately, someone must have tipped them off, because when they boarded the ship, it was empty. Uh, so they had about, you know, the ship was there 24 hours before they, they did the raid. It was gone, and they found, the we pinpointed the satellite tag on a beach in Guam somewhere. So it's happening right under our noses, um, and that was a, a great concern. But millions and millions of people watched this show. And uh, I think it was, uh, you know, it was one of the top shows, I said, for, for Discovery for a reason. We were able to feed the science and the, the, the data in, but in a way that was entertaining and exciting and interesting and appealed to a broad audience uh, and had, had some really key 
uh, entertaining hooks to it, but again, real science and, uh, and real data for it. So um, we're at about a little over 30 minutes, so which is about 35 minutes, which was our plan, so we could have some good time to chat with you all. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's where we are right now. So Q&A, we've got about another 10 minutes or so, and uh, there are some mics lined up here uh, in each of the the aisles, and here's my threat. If you don't have questions, I will just keep talking. <laughs> so uh, you don't want that, trust me. Um, so please, if, if anybody has any questions, dive in. Anything to add? Uh, sure, sure, we, we could use teamwork, okay. please. Yeah. Beth. Hi, thank you for that, and um, especially thank you for the three rules. I think they're uh, very well taken. I wonder if you can expand a little on them uh, and think about moving from communication and engagement to action um, because I think that there's a lot of communication. I think people are engaged. Uh, you know, I think the marine shows on the Nature Channel and all of these uh, various outlets, you know, people really love them. They love to get into this alien environment and think about uh, how it works. But what I think we're missing is that step from engagement to action, and I wonder if there's a rule that could help us think about that. Yeah, I'm sure Olivia has made this. Uh, I'll just jump in real quick. It's a great question. Uh, I would say two things. One, yes, we do a good job with documentaries and the people that watch Discovery, and, and you know, we have a series on the Travel Channel as well, my wife um, and I, and, and, uh, but that is still a, a, an audience that is relatively kind of agrees with those types of issues and is seeking that information out. And the challenge, I think, for us is to, like we try to do with, uh, like we did with Aquatic World and other mediums, and, and Olivia was talking about social media earlier, we need to broaden our platforms that we leverage beyond kind of the traditional platforms where uh, uh, an audience that already cares about these issues is going. Um, and we need to be in, 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 other, in other platforms with, with awareness to, again, grow that audience. But to get to the action piece, and that's really, really key, right? We know behavioral change is very, very hard to do. Um, that's why Earth Echo does what we do. Um, we focus on these guys right here. Because two reasons. One, we know that, uh, as we've seen already with uh, a lot of the, the social action movements around uh, mental health and guns and climate change and, and homelessness and all the different marches and the different things that have been going on, uh, driven by young people, that they're a uh, much more aware and engaged audience and generation today. Um, so that they are not, you know, I think the traditional adult approach has always been like, oh, that's good, we're going to kind of top-down approach, and when they get older, they'll do something. But we know that's not true, that young people are able to affect change now in a very significant way. And I think changing our mindset around how we engage with young people and the power that they have today is key. I'd also say that you get a double return on investment. Um, and the reason we focus on environmental education at Earth Echo is because we recognize that our best advocates for these issues in the household is not a 30 second public service announcement that we may put on air or a billboard in the metro that again, people that agree will agree and you're not gonna change someone's mind who doesn't agree with you in, in a 30 second PSA. It's not gonna happen. But the kids, we call it the power of the nag. Kids going home, I've never heard an adult come up to me and be like, man, that, that brochure that I read, whoo! Tell me about, like, man, that's up my pants on fire. I'm like, wow, climate change is real. We're going to do solar power. We're going to do all this great stuff. Never happened. Uh, but I have heard countless stories from adults that said, my kids came home, and they were nagging me, and they made me do this, and now we're not doing plastic bags. Now I'm thinking about who to vote for. Now we're doing the solar panels. Now we're doing less meat. We're doing organic. You know. So you get a double return on investment. And, uh, and I think as a community and as scientists, as, as administrators, as, as policymakers, um, we need to do a much better job and, and spend a lot more time focusing on young people because they're already primed to act. We're not trying to, like, I've never gone into a high school and been like, right, climate change, and like, uh, it's dumb, it's not real. Uh, kids totally get it. They're already engaged. And, um, and so we don't have to sell that bill of goods to them. It's just about how we help them in, in engage and take action, and they're primed and ready and, and, and desires to do that. So my answer would be, let's stop trying to change adult behavior, very hard to do. Instead, let's focus on education. We as an ocean community 
Um, I know there's not really funders in the room today, but, but funders, you know, there's very little dollars that go towards education. We're really plain whack-a-mole in many ways, I would argue, when we focus and invest, you know, so much of our conservation community's money in legislation and, you know, direct conservation initiatives, uh, you know, we, as, we, as we see, um, we think we kind of have the offshore oil drilling situation under control, and a new administration comes in and goes, nope. And so unless we start to grow the constituency and change society and grow the amount of people that care about these issues that don't let politicians, won't elect politicians that can say that, we're still going to keep fighting the same legislative battles we've been fighting all along. And I think it's because traditionally we have not invested in kids. Okay. Yeah. No, I'd love to jump in there. So I kind of want to like see you raising hands. This may just be me, but I think it's funny. How many when you said you wanted to be a marine biologist when you came home, your parents said, oh, you want to study dolphins or whales, right? You're going to be a dolphin trainer, right? Anybody? I know that was me. My parents thought I studied charismatic megafauna. Instead, I studied the squishy you know, stuff in the sea. So I think that's something that we can use, though. I mean, we forget so often. I mean, so many people have already told me, you know, right now our big campaign is against plastic straws. That's one that's been really against Facebook or all across Facebook um, is, you know, just reusing um, or not, sorry, using reusable straws or, you know, just not saying no to a straw when you go to a restaurant. And what started that in a lot of ways was that video that went out of sea turtles where they were pulling the straw out of the sea turtle's nose. And that's what people usually say. They're like, man, I saw that video, and that just changed my, my entire perspective of using straws. So I think we have a power here. Sometimes we, I know for me, I get really, I'm a young scientist, so I really want to establish myself. And I'm like, no, no, I don't study dolphins. I study, you know, pyrosomes in the Northern California current. But I think sometimes we forget that, you know, people love dolphins and, you know, sea turtles and things because they're on TV, they're in magazines, you can see them sometimes at aquariums. And I think people have this connection to things that they, they find beautiful or they have some kind of awe over. And so it's learning. We study these things all day, every day. I know, like, you spend 24 hours a day thinking about what you study. So there has got to be something cool about it that brings you back to it every single day. I find pyrosomes amazing because they have no brain and they you know, are primarily made out of water, yet they're colonies of these thousands little, of little creatures known as zoids, and they can travel hundreds of meters every single day just to feed. And I find that fascinating. So it's learning how to communicate the interesting thing that you have in your science or whatever research that you do to make it fascinating so that people want to care about it. And then, of course, I think sometimes it's overwhelming. We see these documentaries, and we're like, how am I going to you know, change this? And I think sometimes it's breaking it down to little things that you know, people use millions and millions of straws every single day around the world. How do we break that down to say, hey, all you have to say is to the waiter, hey, I don't want a straw, or you know, you pick up a pack of those reusable straws for like 10 bucks somewhere. It's like that is something that's a small change, but if each and every one of us did it, we'd see such a large impact. So I think it's making it seem not so overwhelming, and also making people care about it because we all know that what we do is fascinating. Otherwise, we wouldn't do it. So I think that's kind of the starting point when we communicate. Um, hello. Uh, so you talked. Uh, you mentioned uh, big data, and so just uh, out of curiosity, what kind of data? How big is the data? And like, what are the possible uh, careers in the, like uh, in this field regarding big data and ana uh, analyzing that data? Countless, right? I mean, uh, you know, how big is big data? My goodness. Uh, I mean, Skynet's taking over. So uh, the robots are here. They're taking over. And it's so big, I don't even, I don't think any of us can really appreciate it. But a great example, you know, we have a program called the Earth Echo Water Challenge. And one of the things that we look at is we, it's a global water quality testing program. And we recognize, we're actually working with uh, the UN Earth Day Network and a few other groups now on a global database, it's, you know, there's a ton of actually water quality data from EPA, from USGS, from NOAA, from all these different groups, and there's nowhere that it's really like all brought together and visualized in a way that communities and people in those communities can really make good use of it. Um, and, and so I think that's one great example of there's a ton of information out there, um, but it's not just how we bring it together, it's also how we use it to tell stories. Um, but man, I don't know, what else? Like. Pfft. I mean, there's so Use much, your imagination. I mean, and that's it's particularly yeah. as we're moving more towards um, we continue to develop this technology of video systems. Um, I know I've worked with a video system out on the Oregon coast um, called the NC2 Ethioplankton Imaging System. Basically, really cool imaging system that takes thousands of like frames in their videos every single second, and then they have 
systems that go back through and then identify which zooplankton are in each frame. Um, and so obviously there are hard drives and hard drives and hard drives of that information just from one cruise. Um, so there's so much, especially as we continue to develop like camera systems and things that are collecting lots and lots of information, we need more people to either analyze it or we need people who can find a better way uh, to analyze. And that's where, you know, you can come in there. Because I mean, and also all the young people in here, if you have not looked into learning how to code in either MATLAB, R, or one of those other systems, please do it. It'll save you so much time because those systems are so powerful and uh, they can really and there's so many free tutorials online to really get yeah. you started so that's definitely there's lots of areas for big data for sure yeah um, as a young uh, graduate uh, undergraduate student I had a chance to uh, meet your, your grandfather um, and be on the Calypso and, and oh, wow. dive with uh, some of the the old the old crew um, I, I wanted to uh, piggyback on the question before about uh, um, besides science, I, I think, uh, and conservation, which is uh, awareness and on so on and so forth, I think there are very important key aspects. I wonder if we are missing a little bit about tapping into the social science and return on investment of the impact of climate change in the economy. I think that uh, when we talk to uh, senators and very high level people, uh, putting a picture of a polar bear like you were alluding earlier had very little impact. Uh, but if you talk about dollars and the impact of jobs and so on and so forth, I think that has a, a much better grab at that level. So I, I wonder if we need to make more effort into social scientists and economists that uh, focus on the ocean. This goes straight back to the first rule. Know your audience and make how you're talking to them relevant. If you're talking to people in Congress, I have a good friend of mine who's an Olympic snowboarder, um, Gretchen Blyler, and she's part of an organization called uh, Protect Our Winters. And the first time they went, a bunch of Olympians went to uh, Congress and met with some House re and Senate representatives. Um, they went and talked about their passion and all these things that they wanted to do and why they love winters and snow and why we need to deal with climate change. And they realized that a lot of the, the Congress uh, members and, and senators, et cetera, were kind of like, okay, it's cool. I want to be able to hold an Olympic medal and then that's it. Go ahead. Uh, and so their second meeting, they came out, and to your point, they came out with a long list of this is the impact of winter sports. This is how our industry uh, affects the economy and jobs in your state. And then they had their attention. So that's, that goes back to that first rule, relevance, knowing your audience, uh, reaching out to your audience, understanding what they care about and what their motivations are, and crafting your message in a way that relates to them. Because some people are motivated by polar bears. A lot of people aren't. They might be voted by health. They might be vote, motivated by uh, economics. Um, so unfortunately, it, it, it's, it's, it's not easy, but that's critical to, uh, to knowing your audience and crafting that message. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. We just wanted Thank to, um, just wanted to say again uh, uh, our gratitude for this, for the, the time that, uh, that, that you spent with us, for all the work uh, that you do. Uh, it's difficult times. Uh, we make no mistake of that. But um, you know, we're on the ramparts of the battle. And, uh, and I am, feel privileged and optimistic, eternally optimistic, by the people that I see in the audience today and the hard work that you do every day um, and the opportunity to collaborate with so many of you over the years and my work with NOAA. And uh, we, we use a lot of the communications work from Compass, uh, which is such a terrific job. Um, so it takes a village, all of us coming together. We all have strengths and collaborating together to make this world a better place. Absolutely. And again, it was such a privilege to be here. I will be here for the rest of the week. So I'd love to chat with you more one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And I'd just like to leave you, as you heard earlier, Earth Echo International um, was founded in honor of Philippe's father. And it was his vision and our guiding goal at Earth Echo International um, to really promote his dream. And that was that we build a world where every single child can breathe fresh air, drink, fresh, or drink clean water, and of course walk on green grass under a blue sky. I am so excited to be joining you and making that dream a reality. Thank you so much for your time. Well done. Oh my goodness, thank you man. Jason, I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Not every day I get to interact with Emmy Award winning superstars, so thank you. <laughs>